I don't know if I've made it clear enough, but I really like Marvel movies. MCU features in particular. After a decade of investment in the world's biggest franchise, you start to grow attached to the characters and events depicted in the films. And once you pick up on patterns and observe the rules to which this fictional universe adheres, you begin to develop an objective standard you can then use to criticize and judge future entries. The same goes for any piece of fiction ever. What's important to remember about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that while it is based on stories from graphic novels, it is still its own distinct universe that exists within Marvel's multiverse canon. Adapting comics panel for panel to the silver screen would be unnecessary and uninteresting. The MCU has done a great job, for the most part, taking liberties with the source material in order to authentically portray familiar characters in fascinating new ways. But how many liberties can you take with adapting a well-established character before it stops resembling the original at all? How far can you take creative reinterpretation before a character is a completely different character? Is Spider-Man Far From Home even a good movie? Will Peter ever learn to keep his mask on? Will Aunt May stop being the MCU's pincushion? All this and more to come. But first... Since this video is a critique of a sequel and a sequel to an earlier critique of mine, I'm going to briefly cover some of my most prominent criticisms of Spider-Man Homecoming to help refresh anyone who hasn't seen the not-so-spectacular Spider-Man critique recently. Although, for the best understanding of my criticism, I would recommend you watch my critique of Homecoming before this one, but it's not necessary. Spider-Man Homecoming sees a 15-year-old Peter Parker burdened with potential and ambition as, since having gained superpowers, he was invited to Germany to fight alongside the Avengers and gifted a high-tech costume by his new father figure slash mentor, Tony Stark. Two months later, Peter is bored of his mundane teenage life as he longs to join the big leagues and become an official member of the Avengers, trying to impress Mr. Stark with friendly neighborhood feats in the meanwhile. After encountering high-tech weapon-wielding thugs, Peter goes down a rabbit hole, uncovering a black market alien weapons trafficking operation led by Adrian Toomes. In an attempt to take down Toomes' operation in one fell swoop, Peter endangers the lives of hundreds of people on board a ferry before Iron Man shows up to resolve the situation. Peter's intention was to use this bus to convince Tony that he was ready to be an Avenger, but Tony reacted harshly instead, condemning Peter for his reckless behavior and taking away the suit. Peter now had more time and effort to put towards academics and his social life. When it came time to find a date for the homecoming dance, he asked his longtime crush who turned out to be Adrian Toomes' daughter. Tension builds as Toomes slowly works out Peter's secret and threatens to kill him and everyone he loves if he continues to interfere in his criminal business. With the stakes raised through the roof, Peter ditches the homecoming dance to confront the most powerful and intimidating enemy he's ever met without a Stark brand supersuit and prove he's worthy of being called a hero. With the conflict resolved, Tony commends Peter for his bravery and gumption and offers him a full-time role as an Avenger. Peter declines in favor of being a friendly neighborhood hero for now and gets his suit back. My critique of this movie was made and released in February of 2019. Suffice it to say, my thoughts have changed over time. I do not now hold all of the same criticisms of Homecoming that I once did, so if you've paid close attention to that critique and feel that I contradict my own takes by things that I say in this video, then you might be onto something. My opinions and criticisms of the MCU Spidey have evolved over time, so throughout this video I will try to acknowledge any conflicting ideas as long as it doesn't hinder the flow. This critique is going to be long, there's no need to make it pointlessly longer. My criticisms of Homecoming's plot have been extensively outlined in their own video, but in summary, Spider-Man Homecoming has the worst continuity errors in the whole MCU. Michelle is probably the worst character in the whole movie. She's overemphasized in marketing material and presented as a source of comedic relief, but just comes off as obnoxious and trying too hard to be quirky. Peter displays uncharacteristically idiotic behavior throughout the movie. If the plot needs him to make a stupid decision, he'll do it. If the plot needs him to neglect his responsibilities to artificially raise the stakes, he'll do it. If the plot needs him to behave as though he is not playing a character with decades of history and a well-defined makeup, he'll do it in a heartbeat. Tony's inaction had far more to do with the fairy debacle than Peter's mistakes, and yet the movie makes it out to be Peter's fault. If Tony had properly communicated to Peter about the FBI's involvement on the ferry, the whole situation could have been avoided. This is arguably Homecoming's most egregious plot hole. Spider-Man Homecoming is a good movie. I don't want to be misconstrued as thinking it is a poor film, but as a big fan of movies, the MCU, and Spider-Man, I felt compelled to criticize Homecoming for its problems, which weren't very hard to find. Homecoming is a good movie. That doesn't mean it isn't flawed. And ignoring a film's definitive flaws does a great disservice to all movies that manage to balance emotional satisfaction with logical integrity. With that said, does Spider-Man Far From Home exceed the merits of its predecessor or pale in comparison? You'll just have to wait and see. We open to Nick Fury and Maria Hill taking a leisurely drive to a Mexican village to investigate reports of an anthropomorphic natural disaster. Only, these people aren't Fury or Hill. Whoa! Spoiler warning! 
I mean, I could address the post credit scene twist at the end of this section, but then I'd have to act like I don't know who they really are throughout the critique as though I haven't seen the movie I'm currently covering, and that would be dishonest and quite frankly silly of me. So, for context, for the duration of this film, Fury is off-world chilling in a star cruiser with some space refugees, so Talos and his wife were kind enough to fill in for him and Hill. Little did they know they were in for a crazy adventure filled with wacky characters and over-the-top shenanigans. But this raises some important questions regarding past entries in the MCU. Is this Nick Fury, or is it Talos? In this scene, he looks a lot like Nick Fury, but that's a thing space refugees can do. Hold up. Over here, he's cutting that sandwich diagonally. The real Fury doesn't do that, but wait, it's not toast, so this could still be him. Damn, Reddit was about to be impressed with me, then I went and messed it up. Anyway, this totally noble and valiant caped assailant shows up to take on the Dirt Man, and we cut to the intro logo with I Will Always Love You playing in the background. Now, I know I gave Homecoming a lot of shit for not doing well enough to capture the essence of being a teenager, but this memorial slideshow makes up for it in leaps and bounds. I have never seen something so uncannily high school in any movie ever. More often than not, the characters in high school movies are complete caricatures and the environment only superficially resembles a high school. But this slideshow is so accurate to what I witnessed in school that it maximized my immersion within minutes of the movie starting. As someone who served my six years of high school somewhat recently, I feel that I am an authority on such things. Once the memorial slideshow finishes, Jason and Angry Rice give the audience this movie's obligatory MCU exposition dump. They refer to Thanos' wiping out of half of all life as the blip, and explain the mechanics of it for anyone who's not an Emergency Awesome subscriber. Thanos snapped in 2018, wiping out half of all life in the universe. Then, Hulk snapped in 2023, bringing back all the victims of the first snap in relative safety. While time went by normally for all survivors, the people who were snapped came back into existence the same age as when they left. Despite such a catastrophe having no precedent in the universe, let alone on Earth, everyone seems to be doing fine. Except for Mr. Harrington, whose wife used the blip to run away with another man. But for the most part, the world just returned to normal. Although this defies basic reason when you consider the logistics of 3 billion people suddenly reappearing on Earth five years after their loved ones had time to move on and make do, everything appears hunky-dory. And because this doesn't really interfere with the plot, I can stop discussing it. Now. Worth mentioning is that Angry Rice explicitly states that Hulk's snap to bring everyone back happened eight months ago. Both whether we're still in 2023 and how Peter is still 16 at this point remain a mystery. As the expository intro draws to a close, Jason takes a moment to break the fourth wall and asks, Because are the Avengers even like a thing anymore? This line works on two levels, simultaneously conveying the confusion of the in-universe characters and the confusion of the viewers as to the future of the Avengers. But from Tony's line in Infinity War, we already gather that the Avengers weren't a thing anymore. It's all up in the air, I guess. Marvel has shown that they aren't very consistent with paying off setups years after the fact, so the more vague they are now, the less we complain later. You win this one, Kevin. Peter has a plan. On the science trip, he's going to buy Michelle a Black Dahlia necklace and declare his feelings for her on top of the Eiffel Tower. So, somewhere in the time between the end of Homecoming and now, Peter has developed strong enough feelings for Michelle that he's willing to buy her a necklace with strong sentimental value and reveal his feelings for her in one of the most romantic settings in the world. He didn't show this type of enthusiasm towards Liz. This crush must really be something special. So where the fuck did it come from? We saw Michelle show a faint and awkward kind of interest in Peter at the end of Homecoming, and now he's ready to confess his feelings for her. There are so many missing beats in this story that it's just daunting how far from home has Peter, in his first scene in the movie, telling Ned about his plan while the audience had no time to digest that he was even interested in Michelle. We saw point A, yes, I will concede that. And now we're seeing point E or F, but certainly not point B. The problem here is that we didn't see Peter's feelings develop to this point. This crush feels rushed and contrived as though the writers just wanted to get a start to their story and skip past the development necessary to making us give a shit about this potential relationship. I would call this rushed crush arbitrary and unnecessary if it didn't play an important role in the story later on. So Michelle interrupts Peter's scheming and actually gives off the impression that she's human. She's much more subdued and natural as opposed to her overly quirky and obnoxious demeanor in Homecoming. She suggests that Peter and Ned download VPNs on their phones so that the government can track them while abroad. Just like in Homecoming, Michelle makes quasi-intellectual remarks and jokes throughout Far From Home. But while her lines in Homecoming fell firmly to one side of the political spectrum, this movie quite literally added dimension to her character. It is now far more difficult to pin down exactly what her ideological beliefs may be, and that ambiguity is always good for a character. It's difficult to empathize with or invest yourself in a character whose ideas are predictable to the point of seeming predetermined. Ron Swanson is a great example of the exception. Michelle no longer appears to be a millennial stereotype, and this gives me hope for her character. We cut to a charity dinner hosted by Homeless Shelter, where May clumsily lets us know that she too was blipped. How convenient. 
It's at this point where the shared universe aspect of the MCU becomes a detriment to movies like this just trying to tell their own unique, somewhat self-contained stories. Infinity War and Endgame were monumental events for the MCU, and the consequences of what transpired in those movies would undoubtedly have some effect on the other franchises and characters. Thanos killing half of all life in the universe is a grim and terrifying event, the scale of which is unparalleled. But when you transition from Endgame's depressing, then hopeful, then triumphant atmosphere to Far From Home's lighthearted tone, the consequences of Thanos' actions do not integrate well into the narrative. Thanos' wiping out of half of all life has been dubbed the blip by this movie. Whereas characters were somber and melancholic in Endgame, Far From Home depicts comically optimistic characters whether they were snapped away or not. It's not impossible to reconcile Endgame's dark tone with Far From Home's joyful one, but it is off-putting to see the biggest event in the MCU conflict with the grounded, intimate story Far From Home is trying to tell. This movie's plot has barely begun because it feels the need to tell us about details left over from Endgame, even though that happened eight months ago in Universe. And I I know it can sound disingenuous to suggest that we shouldn't be told how the characters in this movie handled coming back to life five years in the future, but what I'm talking about is the convenience factor. This movie focuses on Peter, and conveniently, May, Ned, Michelle, Flash, and Betty, all characters we previously met who are relatively important in Peter's life, all got snapped away with him. Okay, but what about Happy? Happy stayed around for the five years and grew a beard. A blip beard, he calls it. I wonder how that one went down with other survivors. Happy is also fine, as if he lived through the past five years without significant trauma. Well, if there's no difference in mood or behavior between people who were blipped and people who weren't, then what was the point of every character explicitly mentioning whether or not they were blipped? They abandoned this formality for most of the movie going forward, so at this point it's just getting in the way of Far From Home telling its own story. As May and Peter leave the stage, Happy meets them with a large check and there is very noticeable tension between him and May. This is apparently the start of their relationship slash summer fling, and Peter reacts to it as though he isn't used to every other guy drooling over his aunt. Happy warns Peter that Nick Fury is going to call him, and he is reluctant to even entertain the possibility of something getting in the way of his science trip. I thought that Peter would have learned not to neglect his responsibilities after what happened in Homecoming, but then again, everything did turn out fine in the end. His excuse is that if Fury needed serious business handled, he would call someone else. This is blatant negligence on Peter's part, but at least it's consistent with what we saw in Homecoming. Peter goes back out to shake hands and gets mobbed by press pests for some overwhelming Q&A. He gets asked, are you the head Avenger now? And if the aliens come back, what are you going to do? But what really throws Peter for a loop is when one of them asks, What is it like to take over from Tony Stark? There's some big shoes to fill. This is a genuinely interesting development of the MCU's Spider-Man. I lamented the lack of agency and individuality Spider-Tom showed in Homecoming and called it a symptom of the MCU. But what they're doing isn't as bad as I made it out to be. They're taking Spidey in a new direction, and part of that means making him a part of this cinematic universe. Tony Stark was his mentor and father figure. Tony gave him two super high tech suits and knighted him as an Avenger. Whether we like it or not, Peter, and thus Spider-Man, is now fully integrated into the MCU, but buckling under the pressure that comes from that. He is 16 and clearly still learning his true capacity as a hero. This can understandably be overwhelming for a kid in his position. What we're seeing unfold on screen is how Peter is still unable to balance his personal and super responsibilities. He badly wants to go on his trip and enjoy time with the girl he likes, but Nick Fury wants to contact him for something. He gets asked questions, the answers to which are far beyond his realm of experience or comprehension, and and after this sensory overload, he takes a breather on a balcony outside, with his mask off, and notices an Iron Man mural on a wall beside him. Under different circumstances, I'd call this lazy and convenient, but since Tony's death, the world is quite literally flush with things to honor his memory and sacrifice. The world is mourning the death of Iron Man, and while mourning along with them, Peter is simultaneously faced with a crushing expectation to live up to Tony, something for which he is not emotionally prepared. To deal with this profuse pressure, Peter decides that the best, or easiest, course of action would be to put off all spots spider responsibilities until after his trip. Peter's room has changed for the third time now, and as he's packing for the trip, May throws a banana at him, expecting his Peter Tingle to instinctively respond and avoid the quote-unquote danger. This is the first time the MCU makes mention of the spider sense. We've seen it in action before, but it's never been explicitly talked about up until now. Peter's abilities are still developing, and it's nice to see the MCU do justice to the source material while remaining true to the MCU in the spider sense's depiction. I was wondering where he kept that. As Peter closes his bag, we see the letters BFP, likely signifying Benjamin Franklin Parker, but then again, you never know with these movies. They could be paying respect to the single most important event in Spider-Man's origin story, or they could be pulling a fast one on us. It's still up in the air, and as far as we can tell, everyone's moved on from Uncle Ben already.
Cut to the students boarding the plane for the science trip, and Bellboy is back to his usual business of tormenting Peter. So, Michelle comes to his aid in a clever way. The first piece of tangible evidence in this movie we can use to assert that there is something between these two. Again, the biggest problem is that the quote-unquote development of their relationship happened off-screen. In order to sit next to Michelle for the flight, Peter lies about having a perfume allergy attracting Mr. Harrington's attention. He moves Peter and himself to the back, sits Ned next to Angry Rice, and Michelle next to Brad, the little kid who grew up to be a total Chad during the five-year time gap. This whole debacle is intended for situational comedy and ends up making Peter even more anxious. Good. Good. The more, more suffering, the better. On the plane, there are a variety of documentaries for passengers to enjoy during the flight. The Snap, Finding Wakanda, Hunting Hydra, and Nova with Dr. Eric Selvig are some options. Peter sees an Iron Man documentary and only gets more melancholic. Playful world building combined with plot progression is always welcome. When they land in Italy, Peter tells Ned about his sorry state of affairs, and we find out that Ned and Angry Rice are now dating. They bonded at some point during the plane trip, thus Ned has abandoned his American Bachelor in Europe plan. Their whole relationship is a waste of screen time, so I'd rather forget about it as soon as possible. TSA agents confiscate Peter's luggage for the banana inside, totally ignoring the spider costume May packed after Peter intentionally left it out. At this point, Peter's secret identity is such a joke that it's not worth getting upset at how careless the story and characters are with it. But don't worry, it only goes downhill from here. As the kids are sightseeing in Venice, Peter buys the Dahlia necklace for Michelle and meets up with her along the canals. They have some friendly conversation that could possibly set up for a crush between these two at some point in the Wait. A mysterious tide rolls in. What will it do? Peter tells Ned to get the other trip members away so that he can help the people endangered by Waterboy with less risk of his secret identity being blown. That is the type of dilemma we need to see more of in a Spider-Man movie. Peter materializes web shooters only for them to have no effect on the creature. Just as the situation looks bleak for him, the valiant worry from the opening shows up and tussles with the Waterboy like it's second nature to him. Peter, sporting an opera mask, offers his help and the sorcerer tells him to lead it away from the canals. A smart move, as without water, the monster will become thirsty and unable to fight at full strength. During their skirmish, Waterboy causes severe structural damage to a bell tower, prompting Peter to try to secure it, leading to some excellent slapstick comedy. More of this, please. The noble soldier eventually bests the beast to the applause of the science trip kids who thought they were safe hiding directly next to where the fight was taking place. Peter survives the collapse of the bell tower and thankfully the necklace remains intact. Later that night, the kids are speculating about the nature of the enigmatic hero and they dub him Mysterio. I just love when the MCU introduces original and exciting characters into the universe. I can't wait to see what comes of this newest addition to the roster. While on the phone with May, we learn that Peter told her about Doctor Strange. You know, that guy whose job it is to safeguard our realm from the forces of darkness. The guy who keeps his presence extremely secret until it's absolutely necessary that he intervenes in the material world's affairs. I know that Peter is terrible at keeping his identity a secret, but does he have to take other heroes down with him? Happy's on the other side with May, and there is definitely something going on between them, while her nephew is on another continent. As pointless as Ned and Angry Rice's relationship is, it does still make for some genuinely good jokes. Mysterio. Cool, cool name. name. Babe. Peter desperately wants the water monster to be dead so that he can go on enjoying the trip without worrying about being a superhero, but then Fury confronts him in his hotel room after tranquilizing Ned. They had met before this, at Tony's funeral, but are only talking business for the first time now. So, knowing that this is Talos, how literal do you think he's being when he says that he saw Peter at the funeral? Because if we give this a bad faith interpretation, then Fury couldn't even be bothered to show up to Tony Stark's funeral and send a scroll in his stead. Talos reveals that he was going to bring Peter to Italy despite the ghosting, and somehow he ended up right where he wanted him anyway. Talos reminds us that Fury was also dusted and tells Peter how out of the loop he is because of the five-year time gap. Question is, was Talos dusted too? If so, then Fury would have even less intel to go on when he got blipped back into existence, on account of his body double also being absent and all. Anyway, Taylor starts dropping some juicy exposition on us about the elementals, and before he can get anywhere in his sentence, people keep knocking on the door making for some more comedic relief. They take a boat ride to where they can expose it in peace, and Talos gives Peter a pair of glasses that Tony willed to him. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Let's take a moment to explore the logistics of Tony Stark willing his hyper-intelligent, AI-capable, WMD-wielding glasses to Peter before he died while Peter was still dusted. Between Tony solving time travel and dying to snap Thanos' army out of existence, he made a hologram recording to display to his loved ones in the event of his death. Seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. I'm going to embark on an extremely dangerous mission that could upset the fabric of space-time. Just in case I don't make it, I'm going to leave my family and friends a goodbye message. There's nothing convoluted about that. On the other hand, in the same time frame, he apparently said to himself, 
I'm sure enough about our success and concerned enough about my own death that I'm going to will my high-tech AI glasses and weapons empire to Peter. This raises some glaring issues. If the Time Heist had been unsuccessful and Tony had died before they could snap everyone back to life, then who would have taken over from him? He willed the glasses to a dead kid and he's no longer around to change that. Worse yet, what if both Tony and Peter died at some point during Endgame's climactic fight? Meaning that even after succeeding in the mission, the glasses would still have no owner. There are too many variables at play here, and yet exactly what needed to happen, happened so that Far From Home's plot could play out. As Talos and Peter enter their base, Talos unironically, nonchalantly, with a straight face, tells Peter that there would be no point keeping his mask on because everyone present has seen him without it. This is Kevin Feige screaming at the audience, we do not care about Spider-Man having a secret identity. Instead of going on a heated tangent about this, I'll direct you to the section where I actually talk about this from an adaptation standpoint. Talos introduced is Peter to Maria Hill, who's not actually Maria Hill by the way, Dimitri, and Mysterio, whose real name is Quentin Beck. As Beck and Peter get acquainted, he tells us that he hails from Earth 833, that Peter's reality is Earth 616, and that there is a multiverse. Peter is immediately fascinated by this revelation. The space refugees aren't so impressed by Peter's fanboying, and so he apologizes. Don't ever apologize for being the smartest one in the room. Take notes, people. This is how you set up a romance. The elementals were born in stable orbits within black holes and formed from the primary elements. They were believed to be myths, but the myths turned out to be true. Thor was a myth, and now I study him in my physics class. The elementals showed up to terrorize Bex Earth years ago, and they managed to defeat all but one, the Fire Elemental, the one responsible for killing Bex's family and destroying his world. They've been attacking the same coordinates on this Earth as on Earth 833, so they know the next attack site will be Prague. Peter protests that he is not cut out for this scale of mission, but we know the real reason he wants to ignore all this elemental business. So, Talos debates Peter, telling him that he can go on and enjoy his trip, but actually manipulates the trip's route, making their next stop Prague. While talking about getting tranked last night, Ned explicitly mentions Nick Fury as though he's as well known of a character as any other Avenger. But his whole shtick is being the world's greatest spy. Nobody in the general public, let alone Ned, is supposed to know he's real. Nick Fury is not a public figure, he's a secret agent. Did Fury screw up somewhere along the road, or does Peter just suck at... wait, I already know the answer to this. To be as charitable as possible, I'd assume that the whole world knows who every member of the Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D. is, considering Black Widow's data megaleak in The Winter Soldier. But if that is the case, then I wish they'd pay it some lip service. While driving through the Austrian Alps, Peter tries on Tony's glasses, aka Edith. Edith has the capacity to communicate with Peter despite being a pair of glasses, with no earpiece accompanying it without anyone else on the bus hearing them. Edith is capable of managing defense satellites in Earth's orbit and finding backdoors into secure frequencies like chat logs and search engine histories. I am eager to see how these features will come in handy later in the film. The bus stops, and Peter meets with an agent who gives him a new suit that won't get him recognized as Spider-Man while in Europe. The movie is so inconsistent with this. The writers want you to believe that Peter maintaining his secret identity is actually a priority, despite constantly subverting that sentiment. As Peter's undressing to try on the new suit, Chad barges in and snaps a photo of him and the hot agent for the express purpose of turning Michelle away from him. Is this comically antagonistic of Chad? Yes. Is it only right that Peter Parker be made to suffer at every possible instance? Yes. yes. With no conceivable alternative option, Peter tries to hack into Chad's phone in order to delete the incriminating photo, but accidentally orders a drone strike on him. This is, of course, because Spider-Tom has a toddler's understanding of the English language and therefore cannot say something like, Edith, delete that photo from Chad's gallery. Yet another parallel to be drawn between this movie and Homecoming. At least Peter's inability to comprehend basic sentence structure has remained consistent. In a somewhat uncharacteristic twist, Bellboy takes the glasses from Peter in an attempt to befriend him. Those glasses, Parker. How'd you pay for these? I'm really paying you a compliment. Before Peter knocks him out like the reckless lout he is. Immediately after one of the students asked if he had just punched Flash, Peter fires a web at the steering wheel to turn the bus and save Chad from the drone he called on him. Peter fired the web in clear view of the whole bus and proceeded to fall backwards into his seat, making the web more visible to the passengers. The glasses fell off his face, and while obscured from the passenger's view, Peter reaches all the way down the bus's steps to pick them up by hand, instead of webbing them from the floor, like he did with the steering wheel not seconds prior. This fucker's priorities are beyond borked. So Peter tells everyone to look out the window at baby mountain goats, and they all oblige. All of them. 
Literally nobody thinks to keep their eyes on Peter after he exhibited dangerously erratic behavior, nearly killing everyone on board. As they're looking away, he leaps out of the skylight, webs up the drone, and lands right back in the bus before they look back. And the first thing anyone has to comment on is his change of fashion. Despite seemingly harassing a fellow student, interfering with the vehicle's driver, nearly killing everyone on board, and wearing futuristic glasses for no apparent reason, everyone lets him off scot-free. No questions from curious classmates, no reprimanding from panicked teachers, they behave as though what Peter did was just slightly odd but nothing to lose sleep over. What the fuck is wrong with everyone around Peter? Is one of his new superpowers the ability to force selective intelligence onto people in his immediate vicinity? Sure looks like it. Now don't get me wrong, if you turn off your brain and enjoy the scene for what it is, death-defying, adrenaline-pumping, situational comedy, then it perfectly accomplishes its goal. It makes us worry for Chad's life and concerned as to how Peter will resolve the debacle. But as soon as you start thinking about what's happening on screen, it loses all semblance of authenticity. This situation is engineered from the ground up to be comically dangerous and preposterous, so when you apply the most basic standards of logic to scrutinizing it, it totally falls apart. Why did that chick not follow up on asking if Peter had punted Bellboy? Why didn't either of the teachers at any time reprimand Peter for almost driving the whole fucking bus off a cliff. How does Peter still not know how to say things as simple as just delete the photo from the phone? I'm in agony at how brain dead these characters are and I still have half the movie to get through. The field trippers settle into their hotel in Prague and Peter joins the gang once more to talk strategy. Beck amiably accepts the Mysterio moniker, warns Peter that this is their only chance to defeat the fire elemental, and says that if they let it get hold of enough metal, it will grow strong enough to draw power from the Earth's core and destroy the planet. Aside, Talos and his wife look at each other in mild confusion, as though this information is a surprise to them. Beck, you're gorgeous and a valiant fighter, but you probably should have told that to your teammates earlier, my man. It'd be harder to forgive you if you weren't so damn perfect. Talos's bafflement is interrupted by an outburst directed at Peter over the drone strike earlier that day, and rightly so. Peter claims that he wants to keep his classmates out of harm's way, but Talos shuts him down, chastising him for calling the drone strike and accusing him of not being ready to handle a billion dollar AR weapon system. Cut to Peter sulking on a rooftop where Mysterio flies up to console him. They have a hard felt chat about Peter's inner conflict, and Beck tells Peter exactly what he needs to hear at a time like this. Not bitter condemnation, but sincere sympathy and encouragement. Mysterio has, at this point, facilitated his friendship with Peter, and it is beautiful. In order to keep the kids out of harm's way for the next four hours, Peter and Edith get the whole trip tickets to the opera, to their utter dismay. Side note, it's a nice touch that Chad is still furiously searching for that bathroom pic of Peter here. Satisfying continuity that's easy to miss. In the opera house, Peter calls Michelle pretty, to which she asks, Therefore I have value? But this is just a joke, and she's trying to ruffle Pete's feathers. This line comes off more as self-aware, ironic social commentary than certain lines in Homecoming, which were far more akin to in-your-face, fourth-wall-breaking, pandering social commentary. But we all know Peter's response should have been, Yes, Michelle. Yes, you only have value insofar as the physically dominant gender deems you attractive. What's more is that once you approach menopause, thereby losing your fertility, your merit in an evolutionary sense will diminish exponentially. The instant your ovaries dry up, you stop being useful to your species. You're on a timer, you see, and so should relish the compliments you are sparsely gifted because once you're over the hill, there's nowhere to go but down and might even find yourself envious of decades younger women who make more of their god-given desirability than you ever did. Peter suits up in his new tactical costume and awaits the fire monster's arrival. Michelle leaves the opera house because she's got a hunch that Peter is Spider-Man and presumably wants to catch him in the act. So, Ned and Angry Rice follow, going to the Ferris wheel, putting them conveniently in harm's way. The elemental shows up, the masses flee, and Ned and Angry Rice are stuck up there. There are other people also trapped on the Ferris wheel, but the movie doesn't acknowledge them, so I guess they made it out alright. As Mysterio and Peter are tussling with the molten giant, we are treated to a great one take of Spider- Night Monkey running up a building, back flipping off it, webbing a large piece of debris, and using a lamppost to heave it at the elemental. Short, sweet, stylish, 10 out of 10. Single takes are seldom a bad thing. After Mysterio lasers the debris into the elemental, he almost gets knocked out of the air and can briefly be heard screaming. <laughs> It wasn't exactly a stoic or noble scream, but I'll let him off the hook on account of the dire circumstances. As the elemental lumbers closer to the ferris wheel, Peter tries to web something, but inadvertently hits a cloaked device of some sort. Probably nothing. Peter braces himself against the ferris wheel, and the elemental gets pushed backwards into scaffolding, making it big enough to potentially draw power from the Earth's core. In a last-ditch effort to defeat the beast once and for all, Mysterio summons all the power at his disposal and barrels into the elemental's chest, imploding it. After the dust settles, Peter ties his web around the frame of the ferris wheel and checks if Beck is okay. Mother Motherfucker, why didn't you do this earlier? For all you knew, Beck was about to kill himself and you held onto your web instead of helping him. With the last elemental defeated, Fury offers Mysterio a role as a bona fide hero and welcomes Peter to join them at Europol HQ in Berlin, if he's willing to step up. Beck offers Peter a drink and so, after having battled a giant monster, in public, they go to a well-populated bar, in uniform, unmasked, to unwind. 
Let's move on before I have an aneurysm. Beck asks Peter what he wants to do now that the crisis has been averted. Peter says that he wants to go back on his trip, take Michelle to the top of the Eiffel Tower, tell her how he feels, and... Give her a kiss. Oh. But Peter acknowledges that he won't do those things. Why? Because I have too much of a responsibility. Well, technically, yes, you do have a shit ton of responsibilities, but that didn't matter when you ghosted Fury, denied the mission in Prague, or when you did what you're about to do, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Are those the- Edith glasses, yeah. They were just on the floor? That line speaks for itself. The dudes try on Edith for Bants, and when Peter sees Beck in them, he looks like he's seen a ghost. Then something dawns on Peter. He realizes that Tony didn't leave Edith for him, he left the glasses to Peter so that he could choose who got them. That makes so much more sense! In all likelihood, Peter's just so desperate to pass the buck and go on his trip worry-free that he fabricated this rationalization on the spot. Still, at least this behavior is consistent with his actions in the past. Peter officially transfers ownership of Edith over to Beck, and with little objection, Mysterio is now both an official Avenger and in control control of Stark's AI and weapon satellites. As Peter leaves the bar, the surroundings dissolve into light, leaving only barren walls, casually dressed civilians, and a smirking Beck. I was not prepared for this twist. It turns out that the Elementals were fake this whole time, and Beck was manipulating Talos and Peter so that he could end up with the Edith glasses. My jaw literally dropped in the cinema, further than it dropped for the tomb's plot twist in Homecoming. I mean, how could I have foresaw that Quentin Beck, the most charismatic, enigmatic, charming, and likable sidekick character in any Marvel movie was a double agent. If only I had TV shows, video games, or source material to help me know better, then maybe I could have better shielded myself from this heartbreak. But I shouldn't beat myself up over it. After all, it's not like Marvel had decades of reference for some obscure B-lister with a fishbowl for a head that I could have seen intentionally or by chance. This plot twist came out of nowhere and just floored me. I could not be happier with this character's payoff. Let's see how the situation further develops. The randos in the bar demand a celebratory toast, so Beck obliges, giving us the big exposition dump of the film. We learn that this team of seemingly unconnected boomers are all disaffected ex-Stark employees who came together to achieve the success and recognition they never could working under Tony. Beck reveals that the BARF hologram technology, first depicted in Captain America Civil War, was designed by him with limitless possibilities but repurposed as a self-therapy experiment by Tony. Beck was allegedly fired for challenging Tony's choice, but there's probably more to the story than Quentin's letting on. Said I was... unstable. Next, they toast to William, the man responsible for Jeff Bridges blowing a gasket 15 years ago, and the brains behind the drones they're using in conjunction with Beck's illusion tech. They then toast to Guterman, the one who fabricated the story about a soldier from a parallel universe who fights giant monsters. Then Victoria, who orchestrated EMPs at each encounter so that Fury satellites would corroborate their lies. And finally to Janice, who learned that following Tony's death, Edith would be given to Peter. Beck finishes the toast by declaring that now that they have the power to manipulate Stark's massive technological array, they will make Mysterio into the greatest hero on the planet and get the recognition they've always wanted. This raises some issues. Firstly, if Beck isn't really a soldier from an alternate reality, then he must have an identity on this Earth. All Fury, I mean Talos, would have to have done is run a facial recognition search in order to learn that Beck looks identical to an ex-Stark employee who has been nowhere to be found since Mysterio surfaced. Either Team Mysterio has tech that can wipe people's identities from global databases, or Talos needs to work on his detective skills. Honestly, Fury would be ashamed. Secondly, and this is the big one, how flexible is the illusion tech? We hear Beck say that the illusions are powerful and the damage is real. The movie does a good enough job of showcasing how the drones function. They cloak themselves, project fake images, and use bullets or sonic bursts to disrupt the environment however necessary. With a perfectly reasonable amount of suspension of disbelief, that makes sense. The problem comes when we see that the illusions are scripted and essentially predetermined. The illusions are shown to move on rails, and even when some drones malfunction, the illusion goes on as if it doesn't know there are gaps in the image. This leads us to believe that the drones get programmed to project very specific pieces of an illusion and affect the environment in very specific ways, with little to no room for change in the moment. With that in mind, how flexible can the illusion tech be? In Prague, the fire elemental seems to actively pursue Peter and candidly react to damage that Peter causes it. But there's no way Team Mysterio could have known what exact actions Peter would take at any given time. There's no way they could have planned for Peter to lob that boulder into the elemental, so its reaction would have to be either totally candid, or one option of a set of pre-programmed possibilities that the team had to render beforehand. Think of how many possibilities they would have to render to make the illusion convincing in any scenario. The logistics are crazy. 
Thirdly, how did they figure that the perfect time to coerce the glasses away from Peter was while he was on a field trip in Europe? It's just kind of odd how Peter's trip and his getting Edith lined up like that. Team Mysterio could have just orchestrated the illusion such that the final confrontation would end up in New York, but everything fell into place for the plot to happen. Thankfully, these aren't glaring problems and have solutions, even aside from the ones I mentioned. The solutions just require a lot of suspension of disbelief to buy. Back at the hotel, Peter learns that because of the threat presented by the Elementals, the trip has been cancelled. He works up the courage to ask Michelle if she'd like to do something not on the itinerary, and she accepts. They walk around like a pair of awkward teenagers before Peter stops them atop a scenic bridge and prepares to give Michelle the necklace when she interrupts. MJ, I... I'm Spider-Man. What? That's what you were gonna say, that you're Spider-Man. Finally, we get irrefutable evidence that at least one person in Peter's social life isn't retarded. Better yet is that this was set up as far back as Homecoming. Michelle saw Spidey ascend the Washington Monument and seemed to be genuinely interested in Peter by the end of the movie. You could go as far as to say that she was already suspicious of Peter in her first scene. And throughout Far From Home, we get glimpses of Michelle's curiosity. This was well set up and adequately paid off. Not to toot my own horn, but I did kinda call it. And yes, there was a trailer that had this exact scene in it, but I jokingly predicted the interaction before that trailer released. Now, could I have heard the spoiler in an Emergency Awesome video or read it online and subconsciously passed it off as my own? Yeah. Could I be a psychic? Also yeah. But what's most probable is that I observed the minor details Homecoming dropped, alluding to Michelle's knowledge of Peter's secret, and predicted this revelation the same way hundreds of other people probably did too. Or I could have just photoshopped the date in that screenshot and have lied about all this for clout. But come on now, I make YouTube videos, why would I lie to you? Peter clumsily denies that he's Spider-Man, she's only 67% sure, just tell a few more lies, before Michelle presents him with the drone piece from the Prague fight and it displays an image of a cloud elemental. The plot decides that Peter has a brain now, and so, with minimal prompting, Peter realizes the severity of his mistake and confirms confesses to Michelle. He not only reveals his secret identity, but back at the hotel, tells her and Ned that he gave Beck control of killer drones and super AI and that Mysterio is a fraud. I sure hope that doesn't come back to bite him. Peter, aware of the likelihood that his phone is tapped, leaves to Berlin to meet Talos and tell him about Beck's betrayal. Meanwhile, Team Mysterio is rehearsing their London scenario in which they plan to use the Edith network of drones to make an illusion big enough to cover a city. This performance was apparently of such a scale that they needed more drones to make it work. Beck is cognizant of the casualties the illusion will cause, but indifferent all the same. He wants an Avengers level threat from which to save the world so that he can take the credit and gain recognition. When he notices one of the drones is missing, he becomes psychotically distressed and somehow aims the drones at his teammates with his thoughts alone. Does Edith allow him this power, or was he always able to control the drones with his mind? If he could control the drones with his mind at any time, then couldn't he just tell them to project whatever he wanted? If so, then why bother choreographing and rehearsing the illusion sequences? Unless, of course, he can only control the drones to a limited extent. Y you know what? I'm overthinking it. Beck uses Edith to track down the lost projector and learns that Peter knows about his deception. Upon Peter's arrival in Berlin, Talos shows up to give him a lift to Europol HQ. Only this isn't Talos. After Peter presents the evidence to the holograms of Fury and Hill, he starts tingling and their surroundings dissolve, revealing a building under construction ripe for use in an elaborate illusion. We have reached the nightmare scene. It's more literally an illusion scene, but that's too mundane for what this sequence accomplishes. Peter, believing that Fury has been shot and killed, is thrust into a series of illusions designed to degrade and demoralize him. This scene is not simply about Beck fooling Peter and trying to kill him. Beck is such a psychopath that he would rather spend copious amounts of time and effort rendering illusions tailor-made to terrorize Peter than simply shoot him. Of course, this sequence serves a dual purpose, as Beck also wants to know who Peter might have told about his lies. But pretending to kill Fury, having fake Fury shoot Beck, and getting that info out of Peter would have sufficed. This man spends five minutes tormenting Peter for information he could have gotten in a few seconds. This is a nightmare. I would go as far as to call it the best scene in the movie. It's a marvelous spectacle, it advances the plot in a meaningful and entertaining way, and is the biggest piece of fan service in the whole film. Yes, even bigger than J.K. Simmons. Before you Raimi fans defenestrate me for heresy, allow me to bolster my point. If you're a fan of J.K. Simmons' portrayal of J. Jonah Jameson in the Raimi trilogy, which is likely a large population of casual moviegoers, comic book fans, and meme lovers alike, then you have every reason to appreciate the post credit scenes fan service over the nightmare sequence. But to appreciate the fan service of the nightmare sequence above all else, you literally just need to be aware of Mysterio's existence. If you've played Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, seen Mysterio in any cartoon adaptation, or read a comic with him in it, then seeing this nightmare 
nightmare sequence is a dream come true. The movie was incredibly tame with fan service and spectacle leading up to this point, and it paid off excellently. My biggest point of reference for this illusion sequence was the spectacular Spider-Man series and Shattered Dimensions video game thereafter. But in Shattered Dimensions, Mysterio literally gains the powers of a sorcerer, so that kinda takes the wind out of the sails of his biggest selling point, that his tricks are just tricks. In the spectacular Spider-Man, Mysterio is a verbose wannabe wizard who Spidey overcomes in a single episode, but what sticks with you is how Mysterio plays on Peter's psyche, forcing him to question his senses and spiral further and further into self-doubt. That is the essence of Mysterio and both versions captured perfectly, but with regards to spectacle and impact on the viewer, Far From Home's nightmare sequence blows every other iteration of Mysterio out of the water. I cannot put enough emphasis on how satisfying the scene is as a cinephile and as a Spider-Man fan. And even with regards to internal logic, most of the scene checks out. The only issues have to do with the nature of how the drone's force projection technology functions and how some of the shots are even possible considering that the illusion is meant to be observed by one person from a first person perspective. With a minimal amount of suspension of disbelief, the nightmare sequence passes the internal logic test with flying colors. If I was a true criticism Grinch, I'd say that because shots like these are so implausible, based on what we are shown about the drone's capabilities throughout the movie, the internal logic is broken and therefore the sequence is a blight on the narrative. I might even argue that there's no point establishing rules for how the drones operate because they seem to be able to do whatever the plot demands of them. But considering that the drones work together in swarms to create hyper-realistic illusions and apply real damage to their environment, there are essentially limitless applications. The drones are designed to do whatever the team operating them can imagine, so it would be less compelling if they had other arbitrary restrictions placed on them. The nightmare sequence gets a 10 out of 10 from me. Logically consistent, emotionally fulfilling, edge of your seat entertainment. Back to your regularly scheduled pedantry. Peter tells Fake Fury who he told about Beck's betrayal, and in another terrible twist of fate, Beck reveals that Peter just guaranteed his friend's deaths and torments him some more before a train finishes the job. Or did it? Beck orders Edith to reroute the science trip's return home through London, where he plans to turn Peter's friends into collateral damage. Peter passes out on the train and wakes up in a Brooklyn Dyke in jail. The guard is preoccupied with having Night Monkey in his possession, so Peter busts out, borrows a local's phone, and calls Happy to pick him up. The Netherlands looks a lot like that Austrian campus from Gemini Man. Weird. Upon Happy's arrival, Peter is wary of him because of the doubt Beck's illusions forced onto him. This is the consequence that Mysterio should have on Spider-Man. It's a little moment, but deserves all the credit. On board the jet is where things get kinda tismy. Let's remember that one of the conflicts Peter faces in Far From Home is owning up to Tony's legacy. I'd argue the main conflict is Peter's responsibility to Fury versus his desire to enjoy his trip, but filling Iron Man's shoes is also there. It's easy to forget though, as after the journalists bombard Peter with questions and he sits in the shadow of an Iron Man mural, this theme only really gets mentioned again when Talos berates Peter for his mistakes in Prague. Other than that, Peter taking over from Iron Man is marginalized for more significant developments to take the stage, up until this scene. Peter passionately vents to Happy about how disappointed he is in himself and about how concerned he is for the world's safety now that Beck has Edith. The whole world is asking who's gonna be the next Iron Man. I don't know if that's me, Happy. I'm not Iron Man. Peter has completely buckled under the severity of his failures. He failed to warn Talos of Beck's betrayal, he failed to keep his friends safe, and all the while he has failed to honor Tony's memory. At his most desperate and vulnerable point yet, Happy consoles him by telling him that he's not Iron Man. He'll never be Iron Man, and not even Tony could live up to himself. I don't think Tony would have done what he did if he didn't know that you were gonna be here after he was gone. You can't get much more inspirational than telling a morbidly exposed teen that his mentor sacrificed himself because he knew that at least he'd be around afterwards. In this extraordinarily tender moment, we get the impression that Happy is urging Peter not to follow in Tony's stead and not to cave into pressure imposed on him by concerned masses, but instead to be his own man. The line, You're not Iron Man. You're never gonna be Iron Man serves to dissuade Peter from the idea that he must live up to Tony's legacy. However, when Peter goes to work on his new suit for the upcoming battle, Happy looks on at Peter, gleefully, as though nostalgic, and starts playing Back in Black. Suddenly, the message becomes a bit murky. Does Far From Home relay to the audience that Peter is coming into his own identity, or that he's Iron Man's replacement? This is a genuine question of mine that deserves further discussion, but not in the plot section. As Peter is tinkering with the AR display, some interesting info flies by that is easy to miss. First off, we see the Homecoming suit alongside the comic version of the Iron Spider, similar to, but distinct from, the MCU's Iron Spider. The other suits depicted besides these two could very well be from the comics as well, but I, with my extensive knowledge of Spider-Man's fashion preferences, doubt it. Peter opens a tab and starts scrolling through options, repeating no after each one. It's not clear exactly what he's denying from being included in the suit's design, but one of the options he clearly rejects is the Iron Arms. 
or spider legs, whatever you want to call them. Curious, as they seem to offer Peter a major leg up against hordes of enemies, but it's not like that'll come in handy at some point in the remainder of the movie, so it's probably best that he left it out. Meanwhile, the trip arrived in London, where Chad brings up the bizarre nature of everything that's happened with Peter, and Michelle comes to his defense once more. It's nice to see that another student was actually cognizant of Peter's deranged antics over the past few days, but his worries are quickly dismissed as the trip members focus on the fact that Chad took a photo of Peter in a bathroom. On the Tower Bridge, Beck commands drones to fool Talos and his wife into believing that Mysterio is there to help fend off another elemental attack, just as they planned. Beck, with fully integrated control over Edith, assures the audience that no Avengers are coming. So I keep a watch list of individuals and beings from other realms that may be a threat to this world. Does that watch list extend to alleged threats from giant other dimensional monsters? Or potentially swarms of drones capable of committing genocide? Was that in your job description, Mr. Doctor? Seriously, he'd better have a good excuse for not somehow intervening in giant monster attacks taking place around the globe over the course of a week. It's totally understandable that Edith could stop tech-enabled Avengers from learning about the attack, but Doctor Strange's powers undermine technological restrictions. Earlier, it said that he's quote-unquote quote, unavailable, but Talos and his wife have no idea what they're talking about. And so we need you to come back, because everyone kept asking me where the Avengers are, and I don't know what to say to that. And even if Doctor Strange was unavailable, there's still Wong and the entire school of sorcerers. Doctor Strange is the most logical counter to Mysterio in the situation, so naturally they found a way to write him out. Beck orders the cavalry of drones to launch from orbit and gets everything in place to allow him to stage the defeat of the elemental, eliminate all loose ends, and take credit as Mysterio afterwards. Happy sends an abysmal excuse of a coded message to Fury in the hopes that he'll pick up that Beck is a fraud just as the jet reaches Dorset Coast. Peter gives the Dahlia necklace too happy in case he doesn't make it, and we get a neat shot of the new suit being created. Beck cues the initiation of the final illusion, and upon its startup, fails to kill Peter's classmates. That was very clearly the plan. The driver left them in what he overtly called the kill zone, but they all got out of the bus before the illusion got to it. Doesn't matter though, because Beck just sends more drones after them anyway. So if all it takes are some cloaked drones to kill large groups of people without leaving evidence behind, then why bother dressing up a dude as a driver and having him leave the trip's bus in a spot where they can easily escape before the drones get to them? The Elemental announced itself so far ahead of time that it made this whole plan pointless. Peter is clearly not on the jet in that shot. Happy airdrops Peter into the situation, and Talos angrily asks Beck for a status report. Consulting a writer from Season 8 of Game of Thrones, Beck gives his dramatized response, and Fury immediately calls him out. They see Spidey gliding in, and Talos tells his wife, Be ready for anything. So of course it follows that she would promptly go to the roof of the building they're in, and await any possible threat with an RPG. Honestly, what is she expecting that a rocket launcher will help against? Beck checks in on his drones, only to find out that Peter is alive and actively sabotaging his grand scheme. Peter webs numerous drones together, runs a strong electrical current through them, and exposes gaps in several parts of the illusion. Somehow, making these drones decloak also made the drone that was targeting Talos decloak, allowing Bay to rocket blast it. Couple questions. Why is this drone's cloaking directly connected to these drones cloaking if they aren't part of the same illusion? Hill was also targeted as a loose end, so shouldn't she have her own dedicated kill drone? Who's covering her with an RPG? Anyway, Beck commands his team to kill the illusion and orders William to render his illusion suit. What could he be doing? Happy tracks down Peter's friends using Bellboy's vlog stream for reference. This is a neat and impactful payoff for something set up repeatedly throughout the film. We saw several instances of Bellboy streaming earlier on, but from a writing perspective, it was a Chekhov's gun to be pulled out at this point in the story. With the illusion completely down and Spider-Man as the only thing in between him and success, Beck orders a swarm of drones to defend his position on the sky bridge, sends a few to kill Peter's friends, and sicks a whole fleet on Peter who's already injured. Not, Not injured, injured enough for my liking. liking. Happy and the kids take refuge in a vault after Happy miserably fails to perform a basic shield throw, buying them some time for Peter to neutralize Beck. This climactic battle scene is fantastic. Peter is fatigued, hopelessly outnumbered, and fighting for the safety of his closest friends. The ingenuity and cunning he displays while fighting off dozens of lethal drones at a time is exactly the type of spectacle a spider fan loves to see. Peter uses the bridge's architecture to his advantage, making the best of terrifyingly poor odds and drastically reducing enemy numbers. Right here, I need to get negative though. The biggest flaw with this whole climax is how Peter incomprehensibly dodges every bullet. And I do mean every bullet. We don't even get a close-up of a bullet grazing the suit or something. He's just incapable of getting shot. The only damage Peter takes is from the bridge and either a drone flamethrower or drone sonic burst. Even then, those are only minor inconveniences to him and even help to take Beck's attention away from him. Furthermore, the ratio of bullets to sonic bursts slash flames is totally out of whack. Hundreds of bullets get fired at Peter and he dodges all of them. No where is Peter's plot armor stronger than in this scene? Except for maybe during the bus scene, but he's not exactly in mortal peril then, so... The worst part is that right at this moment, the drones have a clear line of sight on him and hit him with a sonic burst. Well, now that he's immobile, it would probably be a good time to gun him down, right?
You could have argued that Peter is just genuinely good at dodging bullets if it wasn't for this. They had a clear shot on him and didn't take it. That is plot armor. As they're about to die, the gang inside the vault reveals things about themselves making for a clunky character development. Happy openly admits to being in love with Spider-Man's end, meaning that if they make it out of here and by some strange turn of events one of them sees Happy with May, he will have outed Peter. <sighs> Back on the bridge, Peter MacGyvers the way up to Beck and gets to him moments before the drones can kill his friends. While hanging from the ceiling, dead still, the drones yet again do not shoot him. These drones are definitely carrying live ammo, but still resort to less effective weaponry. If you're willing to neglect the blatant plot armor though, this scene is incredible. Peter has now come face to face with Beck for the final time and must overcome one last illusion to win the day. He closes his eyes, takes a deep breath, and harnesses the Peter Tingle to outmaneuver the drones and gain ground on Beck. Another solid fan service. Why didn't that drone just shoot him? It was a point-blank range, but used a... <sighs> As Peter chats with a wounded Beck, wait, no! Literally thousands of bullets were fired at Peter and none of them hit, but when the drones weren't even aiming at Beck, he got shot. Even the characters acknowledge this shit. So what's up? You can dodge bullets, but not bananas? Yeah. As Peter chats with a wounded Beck, he overcomes one last trick and takes back control of Edith. But how? When he gave control over to Beck in Prague, didn't he relieve himself of all control at the same time? That's never explicitly stated, but even if that's not how it works, wouldn't Beck or someone in his team have done something to lock Peter out of Edith's controls? Seems like a bit of an oversight, but whatever, we're almost wrapped up here. Do it! Execute them all! That's some wacky word choice if I do say so myself. Beck parts with the living by uttering some utterly ominous last words. They don't believe anything and Edith confirms that he is really dead. Meanwhile, William has just finished downloading some mysterious files and leaves to trick another day. Back on the bridge, Peter limps around maskless and sees that Michelle has survived the ordeal. They have a tender embrace and Michelle assures Peter that everybody is okay. She shows him the necklace Happy had given her and it's ruined. Keep in mind that it survived the collapse of a bell tower in Peter's pocket but somehow got smushed off screen while in Happy's possession. Pleased with the affectionate sentiment, Michelle leans in and steals a kiss. The kiss is awkward, just like an inexperienced kid's first kiss would be. They confess their feelings for each other and kiss once more before finally getting it right. This is the payoff to the possible relationship set up as early as Homecoming. It came out of nowhere, literally, and throughout the movie we saw Peter and Michelle grow closer together. The chemistry was genuine and this depiction of teenage romance deserves credit for how authentic and grounded it is, unlike those garbage over-romanticized Netflix chick flicks. I would go as far as to say that Peter and Michelle's romance in Far From Home is the best romance in the MCU, but even then it's not perfect, namely for the foundation of Peter's crush on her developing off-screen. The merit of this romance comes mostly from their innocent and awkward behavior in select scenes. It feels far more true to the teenage spirit than Homecoming came close to and deserves praise for it. Happy meets with Fury and Hill to debrief and Fury has one last moment of out of character behavior. Watching this in the cinema for the first time, this scene was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Fury had acted far too out of character in too many scenes prior to this for my liking. I found it unsettling how much of a caricature he was throughout the movie and felt personally insulted that they turned Nick Fury into such a joke. Thankfully, we learn in the post credit scene that it was Talos and his wife the whole time. I like to think that this revelation informs every instance of Fury's out-of-character behavior in the movie. Since Talos maybe doesn't fully understand how Fury would act in any given situation, especially considering this film's dangerous circumstances, it makes sense that he would miss a few marks. I was ready and waiting to mark Far From Home down for committing a character assassination, but I've been given ample reason to suspect that the odd behavior was a deliberate writing choice. Back in Murica, Peter and Michelle hold hands while walking through the airport. Very cute. Only, how are they together right now? It seems like they've just gotten off a plane together, which would make sense because they were both coming from London. But Peter's cover story was that he was going to stay with family in Berlin instead of returning to America with the rest of the trip. Peter could have used Edith to reroute the trip through somewhere he could meet back up with them, as we've seen Edith do before. But that would mean he'd have to leave London only to meet his friends in some other place and fly back to America with them. He also could have just made another lie to explain how he's conveniently in London after the attack to return home with the trip which raises the biggest issue. These people must be growing suspicious of Peter at this point. He nearly killed all of them on the bus, disappeared in Prague, left the trip early to stay with family in Berlin, and rejoined the trip soon after the London battle, in which Spider-Man took part. Without Chad's whining, there's still a mountain of evidence stacked against Peter to lead these folks to question him. Peter offers for him, Michelle, Ned, and Angry Rice to go on a double date, only to learn that they've broken up for no reason other than to get a chuckle out of the audience. 
More on this later. We get an extended shot of Bellboy moping because his mom didn't show up to greet him. This is more attention than he alone gets in the whole rest of the movie. There were other subtle hints to him and his parents having a strained relationship earlier on. Maybe this is a setup for the next movie's villain? Once settled back in, Peter stages an intervention and directly asks May and Happy if they're dating. They give conflicting answers, which makes for a decent gag, and serves to tell us that Happy's clueless and May's a floozy. Nothing too groundbreaking about this scene. And now we come to the MCU's first dedicated swinging scene, a hallmark of the five non-MCU Spidey movies that was greatly missed in Homecoming. Now, is the movie better for including a swinging scene? Not necessarily. Am I partial to such superficial and indulgent fan service? Absolutely. Peter meets Michelle for a swinging date, and the movie ends with a joyfully thrilling sequence of her clinging to Peter and screaming as they barrel through the air between New York's buildings. The first post credit scene picks up moments later as Michelle has had her fill of swingy time. As Peter leaps away, a Jumbotron alleging to have news from the London battle catches his attention. A clip starts to play of Beck in full costume, claiming that Spider-Man wants to be the only hero in town and is actively trying to snuff out competition. On my fourth watch through, I finally picked up that this footage was most likely recorded after the London hologram went down and Beck ordered his illusion suit to be rendered. Far from home doing very well with setups and payoffs. The next clip is doctored footage of Edith asking Peter if he wants to risk significant casualties, to which he replies, Do it! Execute them all! How convenient! Then, J.K. Simmons reprises his role as J. Jonah Jameson, only this time styled uncannily after Alex Jones. Despite how dated this reference is, I think it's subtle enough that it'll stand the test of time and probably go unnoticed by most casual viewers. In this final clip, Beck looks straight into the camera and reveals Peter's secret identity in front of the whole world. Was anyone surprised? Will this revelation make any significant changes in Peter's life going forward? Can Peter ditch the mask for good now? We'll just have to wait and see. And that's a wrap! Nah, I'm just kidding, there's a lot more to cover. On a fundamental level, Spider-Man is present in Far From Home, but not in full force. Part of him is missing. Peter Parker is a guy, whether he's a student in high school or teaching in a high school, who can't catch a break. Everything stands in his way, and just when things appear to be going well for him, life knocks him down even harder than the last time. This concept rears its head a few times in Far From Home, but for the most part, this iteration of Spider-Man is well removed from the commonly understood idea of Spider-Man. Spider-Man's core philosophy is that of the relationship between power and responsibility. While being quite a simple dichotomy, it is nonetheless extremely versatile. This means that even if Spider-Man doesn't have to choose between entertaining a girl he likes and an imminent threat to the public, the writing can still convey this dual philosophy in a genuine and compelling manner. However, there comes a point when writing stretches the limits of the subject matter to where it is no longer recognizable. On one end of the spectrum, you have The Dark Knight Rises, in which Catwoman is a professional thief, romantically involved with Batman, and struggling with her own morality. This interpretation fits comfortably into Nolan's realistic world while still being respectful to the source material. On the other end of the spectrum, you have Halle Berry's Catwoman, who dresses like a stripper, behaves like a stripper, and only superficially, and even then only slightly, resembles the subject matter. The MCU Spider-Man lives on the border of these two sides, paying enough respect to the source material that we can tell it's Spider-Man on screen, but taking enough liberties that the interpretation verges on parody. He has web shooters, upgraded with gadgets gifted to him by Iron Man. He wears a red and blue suit. Sometimes. He likes a girl named MJ, who's nothing like Mary Jane. He goes to a high school. So? Ah, but he's constantly grappling with the burden of his responsibilities. No, he's not. The alternate universe justification still checks out. This is not Spider-Man 616, but rather a version of Spider-Man who was mentored by Tony Stark and has far more technological advancements at play in his identity. But the multiverse justification only goes so far. To be worthy of the title Spider-Man, the character needs to demonstrate undeniably Spidey-esque behavior and philosophy. Throughout Far From Home, it is clear that the writers and director want to tell their own unique story, but are repeatedly forced to remind you that the character is Spider-Man purely for branding purposes. The main character is a superhero who was mentored by a more experienced superhero. Hero. He's young, in high school, allegedly wants to keep his identity a secret, but loves taking his mask off in public. Red flag. That's not a Spider-Man-like thing. So, do the writers try to reconcile this with his responsibility? No. They act like these two things are not in direct conflict. And if I'm seen like this in Europe, after the Washington Monument, my whole class will figure out who I am, and then... And then the whole world will figure out who I am, and then I'm done. Peter does whatever the fuck he wants to in the moment, and only when convenient for him claims to value his secret identity. I wouldn't mind if the whole world knew who Spider-Man was. I'd love it if nobody knew that he's Spider-Man, but seeing the MCU try to juggle the two is jarring to say the least. So let's try to say something conclusive about Spider-Tom in an effort to resolve the divisive Spider-Man debate for now at least. As far as I've seen, the debate is waged primarily between two factions. Those who judge Spider-Man movies based on respect for the source material and adoration 
appreciation for the quote-unquote classic interpretation of the character, and those who judge Spider-Man movies based on their merits as films first and are mostly indifferent to how they adapted the source material. So while these two factions love to get into it about how they love or hate the MCU's Spider-Man, I'd argue that both factions, holding to their respective mindsets, would hate Catwoman. From an objective standpoint at least, the movie is poorly written, disrespectful to the source material, visually repulsive, and misrepresentative of the main character. These are well-founded examples of the movie's failings. Both factions would, theoretically, agree that Catwoman is bad. They would just reach the same conclusion for different reasons. This is important because it tells us that the Spider-Man debate is not as simple as movie good or movie bad. The faction should not be misconstrued as not liking the movie because it's not what they wanted to see, or liking the movie because they don't care about the source material. One side judges Far From Home on its merits as a movie, and the other on its merits as an adaptation. This critique aims to judge Far From Home as a film first, although I do sprinkle my biases in here and there. For this section, though, I intend to criticize the movie as an adaptation, for whatever it's worth. One of the most interesting developments of the MCU post-Endgame is that the general public is genuinely curious as to whether or not Spider-Man will replace Iron Man. Peter is overwhelmed by the pressure of living up to Tony's legacy, and although this conflict is heavily marginalized, it is still one of Far From Home's core premises. And it comes to a peak in the Jet scene in which Happy consoles Peter, dissuades him from trying to live up to Tony, and then blasts ACDC while Peter does Tony-like things. When I saw this for the first time in the cinema, I found it to be the most disconcerting scene in the whole movie. I was under the impression that Happy, and thereby the movie, was encouraging Peter to become his own man, not living in Tony's shadow. And after this, I got the impression that they had just done a total 180. Suddenly, it seemed as though the movie was telling us, yes, Peter is the next Iron Man. Upon further reflection and four subsequent watch-throughs, I think I get what message the movie is trying to communicate to us. Throughout Far From Home, Peter battles with the concept and pressure of living up to Tony Stark. In the jet scene, Happy assures Peter that he is not Iron Man, that he will never be Iron Man, and that Tony might have had an easier time sacrificing himself because he knew that Peter would still be around afterwards. This motivates Peter to accept the movie's climactic challenge, and so Happy reveals a workbench where Peter begins intuitively tinkering, reminding Happy and the audience of how Tony did just the same. Happy then plays Back in Black, as if the comparison wasn't pronounced enough already, thus heightening the nostalgia factor and reinforcing the image of Tony's legacy being continued. This is the movie's way of saying, Iron Man will live on through Spider-Man. Not that Peter is Tony's replacement, or even his own distinct entity, but rather a product of Tony's guidance and an heir to his throne. Problem is, this message is not clear enough to the viewer. Now I have to pick my words very carefully. I love ambiguity. Taxi Driver and Shutter Island are movies that I adore for how they don't give the audience straightforward answers to the questions the plot raises. These movies leave room to speculate and debate. You can rewatch them years apart and interpret drastically different ideas based on how your outlook has changed over time. Ambiguity lends itself to rewatchability and in my mind only serves to improve complex subject matter. 2001 A Space Odyssey is a great example of a film that is objectively good despite how confused confusing it is. It is not difficult to understand because it's poorly written, but because it aims to challenge our concept of storytelling and forces us to approach judging it differently to how we would more simplistic narratives. Now that we've established that I love ambiguity, allow me to shit on Far From Home for being too ambiguous. This movie is not a deeply philosophical commentary on existence or mental health. It's an intimate, action-adventure story with very little room for interpretation. The narrative is simple, and the events of the movie, illusions withstanding, are not up for dispute. Far From Home is very clear-cut. What isn't clear-cut is the jet scene's message. The movie shows us Peter grappling with the pressure of living up to Tony, and then shows us Peter essentially filling the hole Tony left in his wake while building up his own identity. I make this message seem simple, but I only picked up on it after five watch-throughs and days of scripting. As far as the general audience is concerned, this looks like major backtracking on behalf of the writers and director. It looks like they created a story about Peter Parker living in Tony Stark's shadow before officially becoming his own man, but then changed their mind halfway through production so that they could milk viewers for their nostalgia nostalgia with overt fan service. It looks like the movie didn't know which way to go, so made the best of it and went right down the middle, having Peter become his own character while honoring Tony's memory. And I'm not even saying this is a bad thing, I think the movie remains compelling despite this conflicted messagery, but it does raise the most significant criticism of mine with regards to the adaptation debate. You see, no silver screen adaptation of any comic book character is 100% faithful. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine is too tall, Christian Bale's Batman doesn't do enough detective stuff. I'd even go as far as to say that the MCU should have given Tony's alcoholism more screen time in the interest of being true to the source material. But that's what we have to remember when criticizing adaptations. They aren't 100% faithful, and they are still capable of giving us some of the best stories in film history. They take liberties in order to reconcile the subject matter with their artistic vision, or budget restrictions, or even for no apparent reason. And it could go either way. Could be a smash hit with casuals and diehard fans alike, and it could be dreadful. Point being, taking liberties is not the problem. 
My biggest criticism of Far From Home as an adaptation is that it's taken so many liberties with the character of Spider-Man that it is now too far divorced from the classic, commonly accepted idea. Spider-Tom does not care about his responsibilities until it's convenient to or too late not to. He does not care about keeping his identity secure, or at the very least, does not put enough effort into maintaining it. He doesn't make mention of his crushing guilt with regards to Uncle Ben's death and doesn't even seem to miss him. He doesn't seem to be going through any financial difficulties, his social life is easy, and most of his persona was handed to him by Iron Man. On the other hand, Spider-Tom is a high school kid who made his first web shooters from scratch. He quips in the heat of battle, has a crush on a girl named MJ, does really well in academics, has a New York accent, and rises to the occasion when faced with overwhelming odds. There is enough here that we can identify this character as Spider-Man, but not enough that he deserves the title, especially considering how Spider-Tom fails to embody the most fundamental aspect of Spider-Man, the responsibility. This is most evident when he ghosted Nick Fury of all people, and went on to deny a world-threatening mission and give Edith to a stranger so that he could enjoy his trip worry-free. This is not Spider-Man. This is Iron Boy, an alternate version of Spider-Man who was mentored by Iron Man, has a shit ton of gadgets, and got over Uncle Ben's death faster than he did Tony Stark's. Iron Boy displayed dangerously irresponsible behavior in Homecoming, and you'd think that he would have learned better by the start of Far From Home, but he uses his desire to go on his trip as justification to neglect even more of his responsibilities. So I hope that he has for serious learned better by the start of the next movie, but it could go either way. Iron Boy fails to capture another essential aspect of Spider-Man's character. Suffering. Now, I know I'm going to have to break this down because at first glance, Peter very clearly suffers in Far From Home. I won't deny that. In my Homecoming critique, I berate the movie for not showing Peter truly suffering and for not having enough consequences. Both of these claims need amending because I was nowhere near clear enough for what I was trying to convey. Firstly, Peter must suffer. This is a fundamental piece of the Spider-Man experience and adds crucial depth to the power and responsibility dynamic. When Spidey blows off a date so that he can save the city, he's using his power responsibly but suffering for it, because when he inevitably faces that date again, he'll have to explain himself and possibly come to terms with their rejection. This is an overdone example, but you can see suffering at play in all the best parts of Spider-Man's many interpretations. Homecoming does it when Peter gets his suit taken away and when he's stuck under the rubble during the climax. Far From Home does it when Peter gets caught by Brad and for the whole duration of the night Nightmare sequence. The MCU has occasionally managed to depict Iron Boy suffering in compelling ways, but that was the easy part. Secondly, consequences. I'm not the only one who's criticized Homecoming for not having enough consequences for Peter, but we need to be clear in our terminology. Peter gets his suit taken away and then gets offered a role as an official Avenger. These are both consequences because by the most basic definition of the word, a consequence is not necessarily negative. So when I say that the MCU Spider-Man needs more consequences, I mean that he needs more bad consequences, dreadful consequences, terrible consequences, anxiety-inducing, tear-jerking, life-altering bad consequences. Spider-Man does not get an easy ride. He doesn't even get a neutral ride. Life is mostly hell for Peter Parker, but at the end of the day he still faces adversity because he has too much of a responsibility not to. Despite being an everyman with a job, girlfriend, maternal figure to care for, and numerous unpredictable external pressures, and despite the universe conspiring to make his life miserable no matter how responsible he is, Spider-Man keeps on going. He endures the suffering and he lives with the consequences of his actions because if he doesn't, he might just add another Uncle Ben to his conscience. To be fair, the MCU does allow Iron Boy some suffering, but does not give him nearly enough negative consequences. He finishes Far From Home's story with little more than a limp. And, because I'm sure it'll get brought up, I have no confidence that Peter's secret being revealed will have lasting negative consequences on him. The MCU has shown us that Peter always ends up alright on the other side of every encounter, and while this could very well be the pivotal moment in his story, I have no faith that it will be. If you're curious as to what standard I'm using to measure Iron Boy against, here it is. The Spectacular Spider-Man series remains one of my favorite series of all time and stands as my gold standard for everything Spider-Man. This is peak Spider-Man. This is as close as I've ever seen to definitive Spider-Man. Spider-Man PS4 and the 90s cartoon come close but just missed the bar set by this simple, highly compelling, and intrigue-filled TV show. Everything about the Spectacular Spider-Man hits the nail on the head. The voice acting, the writing, the action, the romance, the characters, and most importantly, Peter's struggle with responsibility. He is regularly made to suffer and faces many a lasting negative consequence. One of the more underrated aspects of Spider-Man's character is his love of introspection. Peter Parker talks to himself, or at least, he should. It's the most faithful and direct method of conveying his inner conflicts at any given time. Although it is a much more convenient vehicle for plot information or character development in comics, where the only method of relaying complex thoughts are speech bubbles. 
or thought bubbles. Spidey likes to think to himself a lot too. Spectacular Spider-Man hit a home run in this regard as well, never shying away from having Peter agonize over his dilemmas in speech and in thought. In fact, most iterations of Spider-Man prominently feature Peter's thoughtful tendency, but not Iron Boy. In Homecoming, he had Karen, which basically subverted the need for introspective narration or exposition. He could essentially talk to Karen as though she was his conscience. I thought this was a neat new direction to go in, but since Homecoming, Karen has been nowhere to be heard. So in the absence of Peter's own thoughts and an AI to back and forth with, the MCU gave us nothing. Yet another blatant departure from the character's well-defined makeup. The spectacular Spider-Man brilliantly embodies the Spider-Man ethos while not being afraid to take creative liberties. Iron Boy does just enough to embody the Spider-Man ethos that we can recognize it as Spider-Man, but so little that it is arguably a different character. And that's not a bad thing. It doesn't necessarily make for a bad movie or a bad adaptation, but it is not Spider-Man. And that's the distinction I think both sides of the debate should come to terms with. This isn't Spider-Man. He is an alternate version of Spider-Man, so much so that he might as well be a bizarro parody of Spider-Man. But he is a strong character. Tom Holland is an excellent actor and plays the role of Iron Boy beautifully. This character is well written, logical inconsistencies withstanding, and is compelling to watch but is not Spider-Man. As an adaptation, Far From Home gets 6 out of 10 from me. Mysterio is the movie's biggest selling point for fans, and there are many Spidey-esque moments throughout. But the writing failed to faithfully integrate Spider-Man's philosophy of responsibility into the text, and failed to show Peter dealing with negative consequences of significant events, past or present. The good news is that Iron Boy's story is not over and may yet deliver the icon Marvel is totally capable of molding out of this blossoming young hero. Peter is coming into his own in the MCU. We are now past the point of inexperienced naive Spidey whose character missteps can be justified by claiming that he's still learning. Peter has overcome the pressure of living up to the memory of Tony Stark. He made his own suit, thereby symbolizing the construction of his own distinct identity. I really hope that that identity is far more Spidey-like than what the MCU has given us so far. The theme of love, specifically with regards to forming new relationships, plays a recurrent role in Far From Home. Peter suddenly has a crush on Michelle, there is romantic tension between Happy and May, and Ned and Betty start dating while stuck next to each other on a plane for hours on end. This theme is negligible enough that it doesn't deserve much in-depth criticism, but poignant enough that it shouldn't go unrecognized. In the beginning of the movie, Peter reveals to Ned his plan to win Michelle's heart while on their science trip. Once more, the biggest fault of this crush is that it developed off-screen. We are told that eight months have passed since Tony unblipped everyone, so that would be eight months in which Peter could catch feelings for Michelle. Plus, however much time passed since the end of Homecoming, which can't be that much considering Peter is still 16 here. But just because there exists a justification for how the crush could have developed off-screen does not correct the problem. When Peter says that he has a relatively elaborate, well-thought-out, sentiment-filled plan to win over Michelle, Michelle, we, the audience, have zero investment in that relationship. Unless you're one of those subhuman smutty shipper people who get emotional fulfillment vicariously through the relationships of fictional characters, in which case your investment is invalid. What's even more bizarre is that Far From Home does an excellent job of developing Peter and Michelle's relationship after this scene. While in Europe, their chemistry feels genuine and nothing about its depiction feels forced or arbitrary. The movie did a great job of developing their relationship from the ground up. Therefore, I'd argue that Peter did not need to have a crush on Michelle at all before they went on the trip. Cut this scene out of the movie, remove the Dahlia necklace and Peter's sentimental plan, and just let the movie play out the same way it did without those things. Would that make the narrative suffer? I don't think so, but I could be missing something. Regardless, Michelle and Peter's relationship is a big merit of this film, despite its foundation. When it comes to May and Happy and Ned and Betty, the picture becomes less clear. I have many biased criticisms of the depiction of these two relationships. These criticisms fall firmly in the realm of the subjective and may even constitute speculation. So if you're not interested in hearing me ramble about how these relationships made me feel, you're welcome to skip ahead to the next section. If you're sticking around though, I suggest you put on your tinfoil hats because I'm about to read so deep into this writing that it'll make Alex Jones' take on the Star Wars prequels look like child's play. Uh, Lord Vader, kill Viceroy Gunray and everyone else in the f Starting with Ned and Betty, their relationship starts on the plane ride to Europe, gets milk for comic relief at every possible instance, and ends on the plane ride home. This relationship is quite literally a joke, but what's worse is the message we can extrapolate from the dialogue discussing it. When asked why they broke up, Ned answers, Men and women grow apart, but the journey they share together will always be a part of them. The best faith interpretation I can give this line is that it seeks to help you see the silver lining in a breakup you did not want to happen. If your partner unexpectedly or inexplicably left you, for reasons in their control or not, then this line could be used to comfort you and help you find solace in your potential heartbreak. However, because I'm a cynic, I cannot help but see this as an excuse for relationship hopping and promiscuity. 
Let me explain. While this line can be of great comfort to a person heart sore over a recent breakup, this is the exact opposite position that Ned and Betty are in in Far From Home. How they got together doesn't really matter. It could have been impulsive, it could have been well rationalized. We get evidence for both of these possibilities throughout the movie. What matters is how they acted while dating and how they broke up. Although their relationship was a source of comedic relief in many instances, they still seem to have a genuinely strong bond as a couple. People who behave like this in real life are usually toxic partners, but we get no evidence that Ned or Betty are insane in the movie. Their relationship appears to be healthy and mature, although sometimes obsessive. Ned and Betty had a good relationship and then broke up sometime before they got back to America. Their relationship did not seem to be under any stress, we never saw them fight, and if they did, then they're handling it extremely maturely in this scene, which would be a reason they should stay together, not break up. The idea that you can have a healthy relationship with someone and then break it off completely arbitrarily because the journey you two share together will stay with you only serves to cheapen the concept of a relationship. Look at Ned and Betty. They are content, despite having recently broken off a healthy relationship. And their takeaway is that at least they have the memory of the relationship to look back on fondly. This notion spits in the face of both human nature and basic logic. We are animals, intended to sleep, eat, and reproduce. Because of our biology, it is beneficial for us to form a strong bond with another individual in order to make a healthy environment in which to raise our offspring. This bonding process is heavily regulated and reinforced by the hormone oxytocin. There is scientific precedent for the clinginess certain people People exhibit in their relationships. Ned and Betty's relationship would have you believe, instead, that love is a switch to be turned on or off at your behest. Even if you had a healthy relationship with a person you genuinely cared for and bonded with, you can, at any given moment, defy your biological makeup and leave the relationship satisfied with its memory as a parting gift. All the oxytocin that reinforced your bond with the other individual is just suddenly irrelevant because, after all, love is just a social construct and monogamy is unrealistic. Right? Similar bullshit can be observed in May and Happy's relationship. They each have different ideas about what their relationship is and only learn of their conflicting ideas when Peter confronts them. Happy was under the impression that they were dating. May believed they engaged in a summer fling and are now not exclusive. The movie then has May and Happy talking over each other about their takes on the relationship and makes each side out to be equally valid. I'm not saying that the movie should take a side. I prefer it when art is impartial and open-minded. What I am saying is that their confusion is deeply rooted in miscommunication and testament to how not to build a relationship in real life. The biggest criticism I have is that, by the most basic standards of reason, May is heinously wrong in this situation and the movie relays to the audience that her behavior is acceptable and even defensible. May explicitly says that whether she and Happy are on or off, they will still always be friends and is open to the idea of their relationship going anywhere despite having no commitment to him. This harkens back to the same problem Ned and Betty's relationship had. The movie makes love out to be a switch that you can turn on and off whenever you please as though there is not a bio logical mechanism in all of us that facilitates commitment and loyalty. The MCU's Aunt May is a skank, plain and simple. Happy developed a legitimate crush on her and even went as far as to say that he was in love with her. In spite of his feelings, and likely owed to a severe lapse in communication, May is using Happy for temporary pleasure and while open to developing their relationship in some way in the future, does not have any loyalty to him. Far From Home would have you believe that these types of relationships are equal in viability to monogamous, committed relationships. I am arguing that this is blatant social engineering intended to cheapen the relationship experience and accommodate unnatural and unethical standards of love. Disney and like-minded media titans are no stranger to pushing politically correct ideology in their products. Their movies irrefutably incessantly pander to one side of the political aisle, sowing ideas like postmodernism and third-wave feminism into the subject matter wherever possible, no matter how uncomfortably the messages fit. The MCU is no stranger to such ideological pandering, and I've made it very clear how detrimental fan support of Killmonger could be for society at large. Disney forces propaganda into their products. That much is clear. There are people who eat it up. That much is also clear. What isn't certain is what effect these toxic ideas of race, gender, and now love will have on humanity in the near and distant future. You can love whoever you want to, regardless of culture, race, or gender. But if you are not going to make the most basic form of a commitment to them, you are defying your human nature, setting detrimental standards for what love is, and emotionally abusing your partner and yourself. You are not a meatbag aimlessly wandering this earth to fuck whatever and whoever you want. You are a conscious, complex organism that is wired to react in specific ways to specific stimuli. You are not disposable and neither is anyone else. 
So don't behave as though it's acceptable to use other people's bodies and emotions for expedient pleasure and then not take responsibility for the biological consequences of those actions. My least charitable criticism of Far From Home's love motif is that it implicitly condones and encourages polyamory and promiscuity, which is even more alarming when you consider that a large population of this movie's audience is small children. Children who are so impressionable that they would see the portrayals of love in this movie and take it at face value that it's nothing more than a choice or preference over which you have total control and and can regulate with a whim. I could very well be reading way too deep into this, but I don't see any harm in challenging social engineering when I see it, and it bugs me how the MCU sexualized and may of all characters, so I open the discussion to you in the comments. If I missed something to do with this film's romantic subtext, let me know. Well, that was educational. Far From Home leaves many a loose thread to be followed up on in the future MCU. After seeing Avengers Endgame, it seemed odd that they choose not to end Phase 3 on its climactic final note. The way I like to think about it is, if Endgame was the climax of Phase 3, then Far From Home would be the cliffhanger slash sequel bait that tries to grab your investment for future entries. The most prominent examples of sequel bait being Spider-Man's future now that his identity is no longer secret, and whatever is going on with Fury in space. My initial thought was that Fury is working on establishing S.W.O.R.D., which, unironically, is like a space spin-off of S.H.I.E.L.D. In the source material, it's headed by Abigail Brand, who, as far as I know, has not yet been introduced into the MCU. This is probably the biggest sequel bait since Iron Man 1, when Fury confronted Tony to tell him that he had become part of a bigger universe. It was so simple, and yet set up for 11 years of interconnected stories to follow. This post credit scene serves a similar purpose. It lets us know that there's a whole lot going on that we don't know about, and could literally lead anywhere. Personally, this is the most exciting post credit scene I've seen since Age of Ultron's Thanos teaser. Then, there are also some less clear things Far From Home might be setting up for the MCU going forward. Flash's strained relationship with his parents is likely one of them. I've heard some theories that he'll be the new Green Goblin, that his parents run Oscorp or something approximating it, and that he'll be one of the members of the Sinister Six. Other members could include the Scorpion, who was set up in Homecoming, some members of Team Mysterio puppeteering drones that make Mysterio appear to be really there, and possibly Dimitri as the Chameleon. We haven't seen him use disguise tech or give us any reason to believe he's evil, but he could easily have been just another member of Team Mysterio undercover in S.H.I.E.L.D. Talos and his wife probably wouldn't have known any better. I sincerely doubt that Tombs would come back as the Vulture purely based on what happened in Homecoming, so that's four potential Sinister Six members right there. I've heard rumblings that the third Iron Boy movie will feature Kraven as the main villain, for which I would be hyped. Kraven's Last Hunt is one of my favorite comic book storylines, so I hope that they do his character justice, unlike they did with the Mandarin and Ultron. I've even heard that Kraven might be an exiled Wakandan warrior turned bounty hunter, which I think is a really cool MCU integration, but would not support for his depiction. Kraven is traditionally a butch Russian, and I'm 100% against arbitrary characteristic changes, no matter how well they rhyme with other shared universe elements. By the end of Far From Home, Michelle has filled out her role in the world nicely. The writers had the bright idea of giving her character some dimensionality, and I commend them for that. One of my most salient criticisms of her in Homecoming was that she was nothing more than Mary Jane Watson's diversity hire replacement. And while I think that point still stands within the context of Homecoming, Far From Home developed Michelle into her own character. In the Homecoming critique, I quite confidently argue that it would be incredibly unlikely for Michelle Jones and Mary Jane to both exist in the MCU, and while I still totally see the validity of that line of thinking, I don't think the matter is so clear-cut anymore. Imagine how surprising it would be if Mary Jane was introduced in a later MCU film, which may be made for a love triangle between Peter and the two MJs. Unlikely? Probably. Possible? Absolutely. When Peter first meets Beck in person, they mention the concept of a multiverse. It is later revealed that Beck's story was a total lie and that he was just from regular Earth. However, this doesn't mean that a multiverse does not exist and does not rule out the possibility of multiverse-related stories in the future MCU. Disney Plus's What If series and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness are just the first wave of what will hopefully be a plethora of compelling and totally not convoluted multiverse movies. Near the end of the film, Peter glides through what used to be Stark and then Avengers Tower. We don't know what this building is at the moment, but I have a theory that it is the Baxter Building, home to the Fantastic Four. I just love the idea that this one building could exist throughout the duration of the MCU and house all sorts of different super teams over time. It was Stark Tower first, then Avengers Tower, what would it be after the Baxter Building? Who knows? Then there's also Peter gaining and accepting access to Edith by the end of the movie. This is big for all future Iron Boy entries. I can't help but think that they've written themselves into a corner with this decision. With an army of weaponized drones and a whole host of other things we didn't see in Far From Home, Spider-Tom has more resources and power than 
than any silver screen version of the Web Slinger we've ever seen. Keep in mind that the drones that Peter recalled at the end of the movie had been modified by Team Mysterio to work in conjunction with their illusions. So Peter now has killer drones that are also capable of projecting hyper-realistic holograms. Unless his enemies have a backdoor into his tech or a spider sense of their own, he has no competition. Quickly, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge a clear and interesting trend in the naming of the MCU Spider-Man films. You might not have noticed this, but they both include the term home in some form in the title. This leads me to believe that the third installment will also include home somewhere in the title, and I'd just like to take a moment to share my predictions for what Iron Boy 3 might eventually be called. Spider-Man Homeward Bound is quite a strong contender, I think, and Spider-Man Homeless would be an interesting twist on the character ripe with social commentary and gloomy humor. But my number one pick would have to be Spider-Man Home Alone. Maybe Peter could finally put all those gadgets to the test. But of course, the biggest cliffhanger of the whole movie, and possibly for the entire MCU, is that Peter has been outed as Spider-Man. The only significant instances of this happening in the comics were his death in the Ultimate Universe and his willingly revealing himself in the Civil War storyline. But the differences between these three iterations of Spider-Man are so plentiful that I don't have the willpower to list off and criticize all of them. What I will say is that this big reveal is not necessarily set in stone. I only know the abbreviated version of this story, but at some point in Spider-Man's long history in comics, Peter was in a place where his secret identity had been outed to the whole world, and he was divorced from Mary Jane. The fans didn't like the direction his stories were going, so, in order to course correct, writers had Spider-Man make a deal with Mephisto, essentially Marvel's devil figure, so that he could get his secret identity back and be married to Mary Jane again. I haven't heard many good things about this particular story, but that doesn't mean the MCU couldn't adapt it in a compelling way. What if Peter turned to Doctor Strange for help, and through him or his artifacts, got counsel with Mephisto and struck a bargain with him to get his secret back, and it was actually a good story. It sounds near impossible to make a respectful and compelling story about Peter Parker making a deal with the devil, but the MCU could surprise us. The world knowing that Peter Parker is Spider-Man will undoubtedly have serious ripples throughout the world going forward, but in the interest of fair and objective scrutiny, I'm going to explain why this big reveal is nowhere near as impactful as the movie would have you believe. The narrative frames this twist as a momentous event despite Peter's repeated attempts to undermine his identity's secrecy. If you think that I was at all hyperbolic when I said that Peter sucks at keeping his secret secure, then I'd like to refer you to Peter using super agility as he gets out of school in clear view of bystanders and anyone looking out of the dozens of windows around him. Peter getting changed in an easily accessible alleyway in clear view of passing cars and pedestrians. Peter leaving his personal belongings webbed up to the side of a dumpster in an easily accessible alleyway. In case any of this doesn't seem egregious to certain viewers, how hard would it be to put the pieces together in order to figure out that whoever's bag this is, is Spider-Man? His poor placement of his bag forced him to wall crawl home in costume, thereby revealing his secret to Ned. When Ned has his gym class brain fart, Peter covers by saying that he has been in direct contact with Spider-Man because of the Stark internship. He has now permanently associated himself with Spider-Man in their minds, making him a prime suspect for Spidey's alter ego. At Liz's party, Peter contemplates showboating as Spider-Man while perched maskless on a nearby roof in clear view of the partiers. In class, Peter experiments with web fluid and hammers a conspicuous glowing rock in clear view of his classmates. Peter goes to Washington only to flake the decathlon and appear as Spider-Man to save his classmates from the alien rock. This is one of the incidents that leads Michelle to suspect him. While atop the Washington Monument, Spider-Man yells to the cops that his friends are inside. Peter ditches detention the same afternoon that Spider-Man appears in the ferry debacle. He then ditches the homecoming dance the same night that Spider-Man crashes a plane onto a beach. He jumped out of a moving school bus with only his mask on in clear view of other cars. He could not be making it any easier for other drivers to discover him. Whoever's missing from that bus, when it arrives at its destination, is Spider-Man. On the way to Europe, a TSA agent opened up Peter's luggage bag, revealing his costume to anyone standing in their vicinity. When displaying iconic Spidey-esque actions in Italy, Peter wears no more than an opera mask as a disguise. Peter rides in Fury's boat in full costume in clear view of anyone looking at the canal. Spider-Man is a New York based hero, but happens to be in Italy at the same time Peter Parker is on vacation there. In the Austrian Alps, Peter makes a scene on the bus, endangering the lives of everyone on board, and can clearly be seen using projectile webs by the passengers. Peter disappears on the night of the opera in Prague, only for a European Spider-Man spin-off to appear and fight a giant monster. Later that night, he sits maskless, but still in uniform in a well-populated bar with Mysterio. Anyone who asks the most basic of questions or snaps a quick photo of them together could easily uncover Peter's secret. Peter wakes up in a Brookablunga Dyke in jail, 
jail where the guard is well aware that he has Night Monkey in his custody. If the authorities took his mugshot or fingerprints, he's done. After fabricating a cover story about leaving the trip to stay with family in Berlin, Peter appears as Spider-Man in London before returning to America with his classmates. In New York, Peter takes Michelle for a swinging date before dropping her off in clear view of literally anyone. All they have to do is get a good look at her face in order to put the pieces together at some point down the line. Not only does the swinging date risk compromising Peter's secret, it puts a massive target on Michelle. And if it wasn't for all of those examples, there's one final massive inconsistency that I didn't even pick up on while critiquing Homecoming. Peter gave off the impression that he wanted to keep his secret identity secure in Homecoming, but simultaneously also intended to join the Avengers. If he had accepted the Iron Spider suit and gone out in front of all those reporters and officially joined the Avengers, would he not have had to register in accordance with the Sokovia Accords, thereby giving up his secret identity? Homecoming paid no lip service to the idea of registering your identity with the United Nations or the Sokovia Accords, but in Infinity War, Ross treats Cap and the gang like criminals, so the rules must have been standing at that point. Was Peter even aware that Avengers have to register their identities? Did he have any clue why he went to Germany in the first place? All of these points serve to remind us how much of a joke Iron Boy's secret identity is in these movies. In order for these instances of unsecrecy to not make a difference in Peter's story, the characters around him and moreover the whole world needs to have stupidity forced upon them by the writers. And even then, it's only selective stupidity because Michelle and Toombs put the pieces together themselves with drastically different amounts of evidence. And Peter's plot armor is weak enough to allow Ned and May to learn of his secret incidentally. Thus, the point still stands. This post credits reveal of his secret identity is nowhere near as impactful as it could have been if it wasn't for Peter's consistent attempts to make keeping his identity secure exponentially more difficult. And that's not to mention every time he's maskless. I'm glad to say that I consider Far From Home to be a good movie. Sadly, however, I don't see how the character, brand, or association with Spider-Man has anything to do with its quality. This movie is primarily about a high schooler who goes on a trip to Europe wanting to fulfill a sentiment-filled plan to win over his crush, but external factors continually get in his way. Not really a Spider-Man movie as much as it is a character-driven journey featuring Spider-Man. There is certainly a charm to this type of adaptation. Rather than take a pre-existing comic storyline and adapt it directly to the silver screen, the writers of Far From Home decided to make a heartfelt adventure movie that happens to feature a superhero. Hero. And this isn't the first time we've seen it in the MCU. Captain America the Winter Soldier is not as much of a superhero movie as it is a spy thriller. And Guardians of the Galaxy is far more of a sci-fi comedy than superhero movie. Ant-Man is a heist movie, and Infinity War is arguably a war epic. The novelty of a movie with superheroes, as opposed to a superhero movie, cannot be overstated. But while Far From Home definitely achieved said novelty, it did so while failing to capture the essence of the titular character. Look at what they had at their disposal. A well-written, emotional story about a teen over overcoming adversity and getting the girl in the end, and one of the most relatable and prolific characters in fiction history, and somehow they managed to put those two factors of the project in conflict. Spider-Man is not exactly notorious for being hard to write for, and yet Far From Home's writers couldn't balance one of his most important tenets, responsibility, with the story they wanted to tell. And what sucks is that the film doesn't really suffer for that shortcoming, so I can't rightly call it bad. I must now resort to arguing that it fails to faithfully adapt the character of Spider-Man, an argument that is tangential to criticism of the movie itself and heavily reliant on my personal investment in the character. Far From Home is not a bad movie, it's certainly not as logically laughable as Homecoming, but it is the MCU's second Spider-Man movie that fails to live up to the icon of Spider-Man. They're zero for two at the moment. The closest the MCU came to doing Spidey justice was his introduction scene in Civil War. I know that scene is only a fraction of the rest of the movie, but it makes his standalone entries look like bad fanfiction in comparison. Coming at this from an objective standpoint, I think Far From Home has earned a 7.5 out of 10. Its biggest failings are easily the bus scene and some of the less than clear connections with Endgame. Tony Stark willing Edith to Peter while he was still dusted only makes sense from a very skew perspective. Beck infiltrating S.H.I.E.L.D. and getting Edith from Peter is central to the plot, so calling out screwy logistics is in no way a nitpick. Even then, the flaws do have redeeming qualities. The bus scene makes no sense, but it's not exactly intended for high-stakes, logically consistent action. It's intended for edge-of-your-seat thrilling comedy, and it achieves that. So while I can't shut off my criticalisms while watching the bus scene, I can still appreciate what it was trying to do. But from a lifelong Spider-Fan's perspective, best I can give Far From Home is a 6. And it would be a 5 if it wasn't for what they did with Mysterio. The nightmare sequence alone is enough to warrant my highest praise. Seldom have I seen fan service integrated so well into a movie's narrative. I just can't get over the fact that there are significant plot points in both movies that are dependent on Peter acting like an idiot or un-Spider-Manly. TLDR, Spider-Man Far From Home is a good movie, but it's not Spider-Man. Iron Boy is a strong character, but is not Spider-Man. And that's not even to say they did anything wrong or worthy of scorn, but it's not Spider-Man. 
Anyways guys, thank you so much for checking out my abbreviated critique of Far From Home. This was quite a special video for me. The release of this critique marks one year since my debut on YouTube's film discussion scene. Happy anniversary to me, I guess, and I truly hope I can go for another year. I love being able to share my thoughts on things and then having total strangers give their feedback. So, as always, I love discussion and debate, so if you have any criticism of my critique of Iron Boy Far From Home, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching, see you next time.